Dr. Sage here. Today we're going to be discussing chapter 15. Chapter 15 is about genetics just like chapter 14 was about genetics. So why two separate chapters on genetics? Well, because as I mentioned in chapter 14, Mendel did not know about chromosomes. However, today we do know about chromosomes, so we need to learn some details about genetics as it pertains to the chromosomes in particular. So although Mendel did not know about chromosomes, Chromosomes explain the results he got. So the behavior of chromosomes during meiosis account for Mendel's laws of segregation and independent assortment. But the first solid evidence associated in a specific gene with a specific chromosome came from another scientist called Thomas Hunt Morgan. Now, while Mendel used the garden pea plant as his model organism, Morgan used fruit flies as his model organism. Now, it turns out that fruit flies are a great model organism to use to study genetics for several reasons. First, fruit flies produce many offspring. So anytime you're working with genetics, it involves statistics and probabilities. And with statistics and probabilities, you need a very large sample size. So, for example, when Mendel was looking at his pea plants, he didn't look at like four baby pea plants from a mating. He looked at like a thousand. Okay, so fruit flies, if you get a couple of fruit flies together, they're not going to make four baby fruit flies. They're going to make like a hundred baby fruit flies. So it's very easy to get those large sample sizes that you actually need for genetics. Another thing to note is that Mendel didn't look at one generation. He went through, for example, three generations, like the P, for example, like the P generation, the F1 generation, and the F2 generation. Okay, well, the great thing about fruit flies is from the time a fly is born until the time that fly can have its own baby fruit flies is less than two weeks. So you can very easily and quickly go through several generations of fruit flies. Another advantage of using fruit flies for genetics is if you're trying to figure out which chromosome certain genes are on, it's much easier to figure that out in a fruit fly because fruit flies only have four chromosomes. In contrast, humans have 23 different types of chromosomes. So if you're trying to figure out which of these chromosomes the gene is on, it's easier to figure that out when there's only four chromosomes to pick from versus 23 different types of chromosomes to pick from. Now, when Mendel did his experiments, he came up with some new terminology. You know, for example, dominant and recessive, we learned about in the last lecture. Well, Morgan also came out with some new terminology. One term that Morgan came up with was wild type. Wild type is the phenotype that you find most often in the wild. So, for example, if you go out today and start catching some wild fruit flies, more than 90% of those wild fruit flies are going to have red eyes. So, red eyes are called the wild type phenotype for fruit fly eye color. Now, that's not the only possible eye color. With fruit flies, there's lots of different eye colors. Besides red eyes, you could have scarlet eyes, you could have vermilion eyes, you can have white eyes, lots of different eye colors. Well, all these other eye colors, like the white eye phenotype, those are then called mutant phenotypes. So the wild type is a phenotype you find most often, like 90% of the time in the wild. Everything else is called a mutant phenotype. So... Morgan basically wanted to start by essentially repeating what Mendel did. Remember Mendel, he started out by doing monohybrid crosses and he took like a purple flowered plant and made it to a white flowered plant. In the F1 generation, he got all purple flowers. In the F2 generation, he got a three to one ratio of purple to white dominant to recessive. So Morgan's like, all right, I'll do basically the same thing, except I'll use flies. So Morgan mated male flies with white eyes to female flies with red eyes. That's just like Mendel mating white flowers to purple flowers. Morgan's mating uh, white-eyed flies to red-eyed flies. Now, when Mendel does his experiments, in the F1 generation, he had 100% purple flowers. When Morgan did this in the F1 generation, he had 100% red eyes. When Mendel did his experiment in the F2 generation, he got a 3 to 1 ratio of purple to white, or dominant to recessive. When Morgan did the experiment in the F2 generation, he got a 3 to 1 ratio of red to white, dominant to recessive. So, so far it looks like exactly what Mendel saw. But it was not exactly what Mendel saw. Because with Mendel, the 
biological sex of the parents didn't matter. It did not matter if you got the pollen, the sperm from the purple flower plant and the eggs from the white flower plant or vice versa. However, Morgan saw a sex-specific difference in his results. So in the F2 generation, he did get a 3 to 1 ratio of red to white. But more specifically, what he got was in the F2 generation, only males had white eyes. He didn't find a single female with white eyes. So there was a sex-specific difference in the results that he was getting. Now Morgan determined, so the reason for this is that the eye color gene must be on the X chromosome. So fruit flies are kind of like us, okay? In that, in humans, the main thing that determines biological, biological sex is the sex chromosomes. In humans, a biological female has two X chromosomes. A biological male has one X and one Y. Turns out fruit flies are the same. In a fruit fly, a female fruit fly has two X chromosomes and a male fruit fly has one X and one Y. So the reason he was seeing a sex specific difference is because there was a difference in the X chromosome in females versus males. Males only had one copy of the X, whereas females had two copies of the X. So this was the first evidence of a specific gene being on a specific chromosome. So let me walk you through and explain what Morgan saw and why he saw it. In this experiment, he started out with female fruit flies that had red eyes, and he made it them to male fruit flies that had white eyes. All right, so this red eye is the dominant phenotype. So let's say we use the capital letter R for the red eyes, just like we use capital P for the purple color in uh, Mendel's experiments. But if it's a gene on the X chromosome, you cannot just keep track of the allele. You also have to keep track of the chromosome that that allele is on. So this is a female fruit fly, which means that she has two X chromosomes. Okay, now she has the red eye phenotype was the dominant, and she started out being true breeding or homozygous dominant. So she would be big R, big R. But we don't just write big R, big R. You put it on the chromosome it's on. So we write this as X with a superscript uppercase R, X with a superscript uppercase R. So this is a female, two X chromosomes. It has the dominant on both of the X's. Okay, then she's going to mate with this male. Since it's a male fruit fly, it has an X and a Y. He has a white eye phenotype. White is a recessive, so it's going to be a lowercase r. Again, you put it on the chromosome, so we put X, lowercase r, Y. Now of note, the R is not on the Y, it's only on the X, because this gene is not on the Y chromosome, it is only on the X chromosome. Okay, so those are the two parents. Now he mated them together to get the F1. Now to figure out what the F1 is going to be, the easiest way to do that is to do a Punnett square. And you do Punnett square similar to how you did before, it's just instead of only keeping track of the alleles, you also must keep track of the chromosome. So I'm just going to rewrite this, what I have right here. Okay, let me rewrite that. So we had in the P generation, we had a female fly with red eyes, and he mated that to a male fly with white eyes. Okay, to figure out the F1 generation, we're going to do a Punnett square, a four square Punnett square. Now, the male fly, the possible gametes you can make is X with a lowercase r or Y. Female fly's possible gametes you can make is X with an uppercase r or X with an uppercase r. Fill in the point of square just like before, except instead of only keeping track of the alleles, you also must keep track of the chromosomes. So we have X with a big R, X with a little r. X with a big R, X with a little r, X with a big R, Y, X with a big R, Y. Okay, now anything that has at least one uppercase R is gonna have red eyes. So this has an uppercase R, so that's gonna have red eyes. This has an uppercase R, so that's gonna have red eyes. This has an uppercase R, so that's gonna have red eyes. This has an uppercase R, so that's gonna have red eyes. So that explains why Morgan saw in his F1 
100% of the flies had red eyes, both males, which are the XYs, and females, the two Xs. Okay, so his F1 generation, that's what's inside here. He had X big R, X little r females, and he had X big R, Y males. Okay, so that's what he got from that cross. Now, he didn't stop there. He then allowed these flies to mate with each other to create the F2 generation. Now to figure out what the F2 is, again, you would do a Punnett square. So we draw our Punnett square. Now the males, the possible gametes they can make is X with a big R or Y. And X with a big R, X with a little r. Fill it in just like before, X big R, X big R, X big R, X little r, X big R, Y, X little r, Y. Okay, and then recall anything that has at least one big R is going to have red eyes. So it says pig, two big R's, so that's going to have red eyes. This has a big R, so that's going to have red eyes. This has a big R, so that's going to have red eyes. This only has a little r, so that's going to have white eyes. So that explains the 3 to 1 ratio of red eyes to white eyes that he got. And more specifically, it explains why every single female had red eyes, because the two X's are the females whereas half of the males have red eyes and half of the males have white eyes. And that's exactly what he saw. He saw a three to one ratio of red to white, but more specifically, every single female had red eyes, whereas the males, half of them had red eyes and half of them had white eyes. Okay, so this explains the results that Morgan saw, and it was because this gene is actually on the X chromosome. So in humans and some other animals, there's a chromosomal basis of sex determination. In humans and other mammals, there are two varieties of sex chromosomes, a very large X chromosome and a very small Y chromosome. The Y chromosome has on it a gene called the SRY gene, which SRY stands for sex determining region on the Y chromosome. So this is a gene on the Y chromosome, and it's the main thing that determines male biological sex. So if a fetus has the Y chromosome, then it will have the SRY gene and will develop anatomically into a biological male. So in humans, biological females are two X chromosomes, biological males are one X and one Y. Each egg contains one X chromosome. Each sperm contains either one X or one Y, okay? This is the X chromosome. It's a very large chromosome. It has genes related to sex determination and other genes. There's lots of genes on the X chromosome. There are genes you need that are required for life on the X chromosome. This is Y chromosome. It's a very small chromosome. It has very few genes on it. It is just used to determine male biological sex. Okay, so that's what you need to understand about sex determination. Um, and that's how humans do sex determination. That's how mammals do sex determination. But just because I don't want you leaving here thinking the way we do it is the way everybody does it, we don't all do it in the same way. So, for example, in humans, females are the homogametic sex. What that means is females have two of the same type of sex chromosome. And biological males are the heterogametic sex, two different types of sex chromosomes. But not everybody does it like that. For example, birds are the exact opposite. In a bird, the male is a homogametic sex, and females are the heterogametic sex. Now, it's called W and Z instead of X and Y, but it's the same idea. Now, again, you don't have to memorize the way the birds do it. Memorize the way that humans do it, but just so you don't leave thinking everyone does it in the same way, not everybody does it in the same way. A gene that's located on either sex chromosome is called a sex-linked gene. Genes on the Y chromosome are called Y-linked, and there's very few of those. Genes on the X chromosome are called X-linked, and there's lots of those genes. So the X chromosome have genes for many characters unrelated to sex, 
whereas the Y chromosome mainly encodes genes related to, to male biological sex determination. So this creates an interesting situation in biological females for genes on the X chromosome, in particular for recessive genes on the X chromosome. So if a biological male has a recessive on the X chromosome, let's say some recessive disease, he's going to have that recessive disease. If a biological female has only one recessive for that disease, that means the other one is a dominant, which means she does not have that disease. So it's a recessive disease on the X. It occurs in biological males much more often than biological females. Because a biological male only needs one copy of the recessive to have the disease. If a biological female has one copy of the recessive, she does not have the disease. Now, a biological female can have a recessive disease, but it's hard because the way for her to have the recessive disease is for her to be homozygous recessive. So because of that, recessive diseases on the X chromosome occur in males much more often than females. As an example, something that is not a disease, but for some of you out there, it might feel like a disease, male pattern baldness. <laughs> okay, the reason that male pattern baldness occurs in men more often than women is because the male pattern baldness is caused by a recessive on the X chromosome. For a biological male to go bald, he only needs one copy of the recessive. If a biological female has one copy of the recessive, she's not going to go bald. Now, a biological female can get male pattern baldness, but it's much rarer because she has to have two copies of the recessive baldness in order to go bald. So that's an example of how you can have recessive on the X and how it occurs in men much more often than women. Uh, fun fact for all of you biological males out there, um, you might be like, well, my dad's got a full hair to hair, so I'm fine, or my dad's going bald, so I'm gonna go bald someday. If you're biological male, your dad has nothing to do with whether you're gonna go bald or not. Because if you're biological male, what your dad gave you was the Y chromosome. If you're gonna go bald, your mom gave that to you. Because if a biological male gets the X chromosome from their mom. Now your mom might not be bald, she can be a carrier for it and give it to you. Now, baldness is not a disease, but there are some uh, recessive diseases on the X chromosome. So for example, hemophilia, that bloodletting disease we mentioned in chapter 14, that's recessive on the X. Or muscular dystrophy is recessive on the X. Or another one that I wouldn't really consider a disease, more of a trait, but colorblindness is mostly X-linked. So biological males are much more likely to be colorblind than biological females. Okay, so now we need to practice some genetics problems with a gene on the X chromosome. So get out a piece of paper and a pencil, read through this problem, and solve it and to make sure you're answering the two questions what's the probability that a female child will be colorblind and what's the probability that a male child be colorblind okay and then after you work through it we'll come back together and i'll work through it with you so right now pause the video and work through it yourself and then come back and unpause it once you're actually done trying it yourself okay so in humans, the allele for normal color vision is dominant over the allele for color blindness. And this gene is on the X chromosome. Okay, so that tells us about the gene and what chromosome it's on. Then it says that you have a carrier female crossed with a normal vision male, and then asks you what's probably the female child be colorblind, what's probably the male child be colorblind. Okay, so with a genetics problem like this, I first I read through the entire thing. Then I go back and I reread it and I draw what I'm reading. So you have a carrier female. Okay, so if she's female, then that means that she has two X chromosomes. If she's carrier for colorblindness, okay, colorblindness is the recessive because normal color vision is the dominant. So since she's a carrier, that means she would be X big B X little b, since the gene is on the X chromosome. Then she's mated with a male. Okay, so males are gonna have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. And it's a normal vision male, which means he does not have color blindness. He's normal color vision, which is the dominant. So that would be X big B, Y. 
Note there's no B on the Y, because the genes only on the X and on the Y. Okay, and then ask you about their kids. Well, to figure out your, their kids, what you want to do is you want to do a Punnett square. Okay, so this uh, male here, the possible gametes you can make is X with a big B or Y. Female, the gametes you can make is X with a big B or X with a little b. Okay, then you fill in the Punnett square, X, big B, X, big B. X, big B, X, little b. X, big B, Y, X, little b, Y. Okay, so inside the Punnett square, those are the possible kids from these two parents. And then asks, first, what is the probability that a female child will be colorblind? Okay. So if it's asking about the females, what that means is you should only look at the females. You should not be looking at the males. So the two X's are the females. Now what's the chance that a female child is colorblind? Well, X big B, X big B, not colorblind. X B, X little B, that's not colorblind. She's a carrier, but she's not colorblind. So the chance would be a 0% chance. Then it asks, what's the chance that a male child be colorblind? Again, since it's asking about the male child, don't look at the females, only look at the males. X, Y's are males. X, big B, Y, not colorblind. X, little B, Y, he is colorblind. So for the males, one out of two, okay, or 50% are colorblind. Okay, so that's how you would solve that one. And here's another one. Okay, so again, read through this on your own pencil and paper, work it out, work the entire thing out when you think you have the right answer, unpause the video. So pause the video right now, try to work it out. Okay, so this time, after you've read it, you go through and you reread it, and it says you have a carrier female, so X big B, X little b, is crossed with a colorblind male, so X little b, Y would be the color of my male. Then again, you do the Punnett square. Okay, the male, the possible gametes you can make is X little b, Y. Female, X big b, X little b. Fill it in just like before. X big b, X little b, X little b, X little b, X big b, y, X little b, y. Okay, and then the first question asks about the female child. What's the chance for the female child would be color blind? So again, only look at the females. Okay, so X big b, X little b, she's not color blind, she's a carrier. X little b, X little b, she is color blind. So the chance that a female is color blind is one out of two or 50%. Next question, ask about the male child, chance that he's colorblind. Again, only look at the males now. X big B, Y, not colorblind. X little B, Y, he is colorblind. So the chance that a male child is colorblind is 50%. And that's how you solve that one. All right, so in regards to the X chromosome, we actually have a little bit of an issue with the X chromosome. And the fact is, is that biological females have two copies of all the genes on the X while biological males only have one copy of all the genes on the X. And it turns out that actually is not okay. You actually need to have the correct number of copies of your genes. When you have different numbers of copies of your genes, it can cause problems, and we'll talk about it in a later chapter. So in order to solve that problem, what happens is inside the cell of every single uh, female, one of the two X chromosomes is inactivated or turned off and that inactive X is called a bar body so one of these two is going to be switched off now that creates a unique situation in a biological female if they're heterozygous for some gene on the X chromosome because in all of her cells in every single one of her cells she's going to be heterozygous for that gene on the X chromosome but in every single cell, one of the two X chromosomes is going to be turned off, and it's completely random which one. 
So let's say in this cell, she turns off this X chromosome. That means that cell is only going to express the dominant version of that gene. Whereas in this cell, she turns off this version of the X chromosome. That means in that cell, she's only going to express the recessive version of that gene. So what that means is, if a biological female is heterozygous for a gene on the X chromosome, then she's going to be a mosaic for that character. In other words, some of her cells are going to express the dominant, and some of her cells are going to express the recessive. And we can actually see this phenotypically, at least in cats. If you've ever seen a calico cat, calico cats are essentially always female. There is a rare case where a calico cat can be male, but we might talk about that in a later chapter. So for today, we're going to say all calico cats are females. Okay, now the calico cats, the reason that they're females is because the gene that determines the fur color is on the X chromosome. And a calico cat is a heterozygote. They have one orange version of the gene, one black version of the gene. But remember, in all of her cells, one of those two X chromosomes is going to be turned off. So let's say in some cells, she's going to inactivate the X chromosome that has the orange version of the gene. In that case, she's only going to express the black version of the gene, and that creates the black patches of fur. But in other cells, she's going to turn off the X chromosome that has a black version of the gene. So in those cells, she's only going to express the orange version of the gene, and that creates the orange patches of fur. Okay, and that's how you get a calico cat. Okay, due to this inactive X or this bar body that you find in females. Okay, so when Mendel was doing his experiments, what Mendel saw is that the genes he looked at, they sorted independently. They did not stay linked together. In other words, if you had a yellow and round P and a green and wrinkled P, the yellow did not actually have to stay together with the round. You could actually get yellow with wrinkled. And green did not stay together with the wrinkled. You could get green with round. So the genes were not linked together or stuck together. They could sort independently. It turns out that the reason that Mendel saw that is because every gene he looked at happened to be on a different chromosome. So because the gene for, let's say, yellow versus uh, green and the gene for round versus wrinkled were on two different chromosomes. Remember during meiosis, in particular metaphase one of meiosis one, when the chromosomes line up down the middle of the cell as homologous pairs, okay, they sort independently of each other. So the yellow does not have to line up with the round. The yellow could line up with the wrinkled. Okay, so that's why Mendel saw independent assortment because all seven genes he looked at happened to just by chance be on seven different chromosomes. What happens if two genes are on the same chromosome? Like if yellow, or let's say capital Y, is on the same chromosome as capital A, and little y is on the same chromosome as little a. In that case, they should not sort independently. They should stay linked together. The big Y should stay with the big A. Little y should stay with little a because they're on the same chromosome. Okay, so that's what Morgan next wanted to test. So Morgan essentially wanted to repeat Mendel's dihybrid experiment. Remember, Mendel was starting with a yellow round pea plant and made it to a green wrinkled pea plant. So Morgan wanted to do basically the same thing except in fruit flies. So he started with a fly that had gray body color and normal shaped wings. And he made it to a fly that had black body color and vestigial wings or like shrunken up wings. So this is just like yellow peas that were round made it to green peas that were wrinkled. So a dihybrid cross is just using flies instead of pea plants. Now before I explain the results he got and why he got them, first another thing you need to learn about genetics nomenclature. Remember with genetics I told you if it's a dominant gene then you represent it by an uppercase letter. If it's a recessive gene, you represent it by a lowercase letter. But all the genes we've looked at so far, we've represented as a one-letter abbreviation, like P for purple, 
lowercase b for white, uh, capital Y for yellow, little y for green, capital R for round, little r for wrinkled. However, there's only 26 letters. So there's going to be times we have to represent a gene by more than a one letter abbreviation. Okay, so how do you write it then? Okay, so for example, in these flies, <clears throat> the body color, that is a one letter abbreviation. Okay, so this fly here, the black body color, that's a recessive. Okay, and we're going to use the letter B. So this would be little b, little b, because it's going to be homozygous recessive. The gray body color, that's the dominant. Okay, and this fly is actually starting out as a heterozygote. So that's going to be like uppercase B, little b. So this is just like big P, little p, little p, little p, just like Mendel did. But the wing shape, vestigial, that's going to be a two-letter abbreviation. We're going to represent it as VG. Okay, so this fly here was homozygous recessive for vestigial wings. So the way we would write that is little VG, little VG. So this is one copy of the gene, just like this is one copy of the gene. This is the other copy of the gene, just like this is the other copy of the gene. It's just a two-letter abbreviation instead of a one-letter abbreviation. Now this fly was heterozygous for vestigial. Okay, and so like with Mendel, that'd be like big P, little p, or here, big B, little b. Okay, if it is a dominant with a more than one letter abbreviation, then you only capitalize the first letter. So the way we would actually write this, since it's a heterozygote, is big V, little g, little v, little g. So this is one copy of the gene, that's the dominant allele, just like this. This is the other copy of the gene, and that's a recessive allele, just like this. So if it's dominant, you only capitalize the first letter, not the second letter. Like if this fly were homozygous dominant, you'd write big V, little g, big V, little g. That would be homozygous dominant. Okay, but it is a heterozygote, we're starting with. Okay, so that's how you write it. So if we're starting out with these two flies, so this fly is heterozygous for the B gene and heterozygous for the VG gene, and this fly is homozygous recessive for both genes, then when you mate them together, if the gene sorted independently, then what you should get is equal numbers of all four possible phenotypes. It should be a one to one to one to one ratio for the four possible phenotypes. However, that is not what Morgan saw. What Morgan saw is that body color and wing size are usually inherited together in specific combinations, so ones that looked like the parents. He noted that these genes do not sort independently, and reason that the reason that they do not sort independently is because they actually are on the same chromosome. So if you think about that, that makes sense. So if we have a chromosome here, and it has the big B and the big VG on it. And the other homologous chromosome has the little B and little VG on it. In that case, the two dominant should stay together because they're physically on the same piece of DNA that's called being linked. The two recessives should stay together because they're physically on the same piece of DNA. Again, that's called being linked. So it would make sense that they would not sort independently. It would make sense that they would stay linked together because they're on the same chromosome. And that's what he saw most of the time. Most of the time, he saw the genes that were on the same chromosome were linked together. However, that's not all he saw. He also saw kids that looked like kind of a mix-up of the two parents. And at first, that does not make sense until you remember what happens during meiosis. During meiosis 1, the homologous chromosomes synapse, line up side by side, and when they're lined up side by side, they can exchange the tips of their chromatids. So if a crossover happens to happen between these two genes, let's say here and here, What's going to happen is you're going to trade the tips of the chromatids. So this big VG is now going to be over here, and this little VG is now going to be over here. So because of crossing over, you can get a big B with a little VG. You can get a little B with a big VG.
And that explains why sometimes it looked like the genes were not linked together. Okay, or in prettier version, if you have the little b with the little vg, the big b with the big vg, they should stay linked together, dominant with dominant, recessive with recessive, except you can get a crossover between those two genes. And if you get a crossover between those two genes, you can get a little b with a big vg and a big b with a little vg. Okay. And that's what Morgan saw with his experiments, is that genes that are on the same chromosome, they tend to stay linked together, but they're never completely linked because crossing over happens between them. So here's an example of an experiment that Morgan did. He took a fly that had... Um, gray body color and normal wings, and made it to a fly that had black body color and vestigial wings. He made it them together, and then he looked at the kids. And some of the kids looked like their parents. So they had uh, black body color with vestigial wings, and they had gray body color with normal wings. But some of the kids looked like a mix-up of the parents. So gray body color with vestigial wings, whereas gray was with normal. And black body color with normal wings, whereas black was with vestigial. And he called these kids recombinant phenotypes. The reason is because those kids arose due to a recombination. A crossing over happened between those two genes. Okay. So he actually did the experiment. He made these flies together. He got the kids. And what he did is he counted the kids. You know, how many kids looked like their parents versus how many kids looked like there was a recombination between those two genes. And using this information, he could calculate something called recombinant frequency. Recombinant frequency is where you take the number of recombinants, okay, and you divide by the total number of kids. Okay, and then that will give you a number. And that's recombinant frequency. Now what this number is essentially telling you is it's telling you how far away from each other those two genes are. Because let's say that we have a chromosome here. And that chromosome has three genes that we're going to look at. Let's say it has gene A, gene B and gene C. Okay, in, in this chromosome, okay, a crossover can happen essentially randomly anywhere along this chromosome R. Okay, so it can happen basically randomly anywhere on this chromosome. Now, what this means is a crossover is much more likely to happen between B and C than it is between A and B. Because let's say a crossover is going to happen randomly somewhere on this chromosome. So it's going to happen somewhere on here, just randomly it's going to happen. You're going to need a crossover somewhere on here. Okay, well, the distance between B and C is bigger. So that's essentially like a bigger target to just hit by chance. The distance between A and B is much smaller, so that's a smaller target to hit by chance. So if you're just going to randomly like hit somewhere on here and do a crossover wherever you happen to hit, that's much more likely to happen between B and C because it's a bigger distance between them. A and B is a smaller distance, so you're less likely to get crossover between them. So what this recombinant frequency is telling you is basically how far the genes are away from each other. The bigger this number is, that means the more recombinants you have. Okay, the more recombinants you have, the farther the genes were away from each other. So this recombinant frequency is really telling you on the chromosomes how far are those genes away from each other. And this is important because this is how we started to determine where the genes were on a chromosome. So for example, this is the X chromosome in fruit flies, and these are some of the genes on the X chromosome. Now how we know where those genes are located is what Morgan did is he took every possible phenotype you could find, and he made it to every other possible phenotype you could find. For example, he took a yellow-bodied fly and he made it to a white-eyed fly. Now, since those genes are very close to each other, he didn't get a recombinant very often between them. But then he took a yellow-bodied fly and he made it to a vermilion-eyed fly. Now, since those genes are much farther apart, he got a recombinant a lot more often. 
Then he took a yellow-bodied fly, made it to a miniature wing fly. Those genes are even farther apart, so he got her combination even more often. So by doing this, what Morgan started to do is he started to figure out where the genes are on the chromosomes. And that's how he started to determine the maps of the chromosomes. Now, there's one other term that you should know, and that is a unit of map distance called a centimorgan. So one unit of map distance or one centimorgan equals a 1% recombinant frequency. So a 1% chance of recombination between those two genes. Okay, so they named this after Thomas Hunt Morgan. They just called it a centimorgan uh, because he's the one who discovered this. So one centimorgan means there's a 1% chance of recombination or 1% recombinant frequency between two genes. All right, so since we're talking about genetics, and we're talking about chromosomes and how the chromosomes relate to genetics, something else we need to discuss is what happens when there's big changes to the chromosomes. It turns out that large-scale chromosomal alterations in humans and other mammals often lead to miscarriages across a variety of developmental disorders. So as an example, okay, your cells do the process of meiosis. We learned that in a prior chapter. And what should happen is you should separate the chromosomes so that when you make the gametes, either sperm cells or egg cells, you have one of each type of chromosome. Okay, and our cells are very good at doing meiosis, but they're not perfect. Sometimes a mistake happens. One type of mistake is called a non-disjunction. A non-disjunction is when the chromosomes fail to separate properly. For example, during meiosis 1, what should happen is the two homologous chromosomes, like chromosome 1 and the other chromosome 1, should move to two opposite sides of the cell. But sometimes, let's say both, let's say chromosome 2s, move to the same side of the cell. Okay, if that happens, in the end, what's going to happen is you're going to make gametes that all have one copy of chromosome 1, like they should. But then some of the gametes that have two copies of chromosome 2, and some of the gametes are not going to have a copy of chromosome 2. Okay, so these gametes have one too many or one too few of a chromosome. And that happens through the process of non-disjunction. Now that can cause some issues. For example, let's say instead of chromosome 2, these gametes got two copies of chromosome 21. Okay, and let's then this non-disjunction can happen in sperm cells or egg cells. It happens in both of them. Let's say this happened in an egg cell. And then it's going to combine with the sperm cell that also has one copy of chromosome 21, as it should. That's then going to make a zygote that has three copies of chromosome 21. That's called trisomy 21. And that's what causes Down syndrome, having three copies of chromosome 21. So you can live with having three copies of chromosome 21, but you're going to have Down syndrome. Any of the other chromosomes, besides chromosome 21 and the sex chromosomes we'll talk about in a second, any of the other chromosomes, you cannot live with the wrong number of copies. Okay, it is lethal. You cannot survive fetal development. So we actually have a much higher rate of very early term miscarriages than most people realize. And a lot of that comes from these non-disjunctions happening. Okay, because you cannot survive fetal development. Like if you have three copies of chromosome two, uh, three copies of chromosome 20, or only one copy of chromosome 1, or one copy of chromosome 10, you cannot survive fetal development. Okay, it causes lethality. Okay, so a lot of these very early term miscarriages cause, come from this non disjunction happening. Um, now, non disjunction can happen during uh, meiosis 1 when you should be separating homologous chromosomes, or it can happen during meiosis 2 when you should be separating sister chromatids. Either way, you get a game that has one too many or one too few of a chromosome. And that results in aneuploidy, which is when you have one too many or one too few of a particular chromosome. So a monosomic zygote, remember this prefix mono means one, uh, has only one copy of a particular chromosome. Or a trisomic zygote, this prefix tri means three, has three copies of a particular chromosome. For example, this individual here, she has Down syndrome. The reason is because she has three copies of chromosome 21. Okay, now any of the other chromosomes, besides chromosome 21 and the sex chromosomes we'll talk about in a second, any of the other chromosomes, 
you cannot live with the wrong number of copies. If you were to have three copies of chromosome one, it's lethal. Three, chromosomes, three copies of chromosome three, it's lethal. Only one copy of chromosome 11 is lethal. Okay, the only ones you can live with abnormal numbers of copies is chromosome 21 or the sex chromosomes. Chromosome 21, it causes Down syndrome. Or the sex chromosomes, okay, you can, for example, have an individual that has um, two copies of chromosome X and a copy of chromosome Y. Okay, so you have two X's and a Y. Okay, since there's a Y chromosome, you have the SRY gene, so it'll develop anatomically into a male. Okay, but you have Klinefelder syndrome, which honestly, I don't remember all this, uh, the symptoms. I think they have abnormally long limbs. I don't remember what other symptoms they have. Or you can have a biological female who has only one copy of the X, not two X's, not an X and a Y, okay, only one X. Okay, that's called monosomy X, and it creates some condition called Turner syndrome. And these females are sterile. They cannot have kids of their own. But you can live with abnormal numbers of copies of the sex chromosomes or chromosome 21. Any other chromosomes, it's lethal. You cannot survive fetal development. So aneuploidy is one too many or one too few of a chromosome. Okay, some organisms can also be polyploid. Polyploidy is when you have an entire extra set of chromosomes. So instead of being diploid, two of every chromosome, you could be triploid, three of every type of chromosome, or tetraploid, four of every type of chromosome. Now, humans cannot do this. This would be lethal, but plants do this just fine. Plants are completely fine being polyploid. Now, besides having a whole extra chromosome or losing a whole chromosome, you can also have large changes to the chromosomes called deletions, duplications, inversions, and translocations. And let me explain those through a figure. So let's say that this represents a chromosome and let's say we label the chromosome like A through H. And these letters, that doesn't represent a gene. It represents a chunk of the chromosome. Like that might be a hundred genes. Okay, so something can happen where a piece of the chromosome, like this piece here, is cut out and removed, okay? That's called a deletion. You're removing a chunk of the chromosome, okay? And that can cause problems because you need to have the right number of copies of your genes. And in this case, you're missing one copy of all those genes in that region you deleted. Or you can have a piece of the chromosome that you make an extra copy of, okay? That's called a duplication. You've duplicated part of the chromosome. So you have two copies of the B and C section. And again, that can cause problems. Why? Because you need to have the correct number of copies of your genes. For example, having three copies of all the genes of chromosome 21, that causes Down syndrome. Okay, well here we're having three copies of all of these genes because there's two copies here plus one copy on the other chromosome, the other homologous chromosome. Or you can have an inversion. An inversion is where the piece of the chromosome is cut out and removed, and it's put back, but it's put back backwards. Okay, so instead of being A, B, C, D, E, it's A, D, C, B, E. Now, at first, this might not seem like it would matter that much. You have the same pieces of DNA here as here. It's just put back backwards. But first, remember that these are not individual genes. These are like hundreds of genes. So if you happen to cut it right in the middle of a gene, well, half of the gene is here and half of the gene is here. That gene is definitely not going to work. But also something you'll learn as you keep going up in biology, if you take higher level biology courses, what you'll learn is it matters where a gene is. A gene that's like, let's say right here, close to the tip of the chromosome, it's called the telomere, is not going to behave the same as a gene that's here close to the centromere it's going to be expressed or used differently. Okay, so it actually matters where the genes are on the chromosome. So it might be used wrong and the gene might not function correctly. Or you can have a translocation. So here, let's try, we have two different chromosomes. Let's say we have chromosome one and chromosome two. And let's say a piece of chromosome one is cut off and it's put back, but it's put back on chromosome two. A piece of chromosome 2 is put back, but it's put back on chromosome 1. That's called a translocation, where a piece of one chromosome is placed onto a different chromosome. Again, that can cause problems. Now, most of these problems, where they come from, is actually come from errors during crossing over. 
So during crossing over, what should happen is two homologous chromosomes, like chromosome 1 and the other chromosome 1, should line up side by side and exchange the tips of their chromosomes. Well, let's say accidentally chromosome 1 lines up with chromosome 2, and they cross over. Well, that's going to cause a translocation. Or let's say we have chromosome 1 lining up with chromosome 1. But instead of lining up exactly at the exact same places, instead, let's say what happens is when chromosome 1 lines up with chromosome 1, it lines up like a little bit offset. Okay. And then it exchanges their tips, like let's say here with here. In that case, that will create both a deletion and a duplication at the same time. So a lot of these errors come from errors during crossing over. And these errors can cause serious symptoms. For example, a syndrome called cry of the cat results from a specific deletion of part of chromosome 5. Okay, a child born with this syndrome has uh, severe developmental disabilities, a cat-like cry, and usually dies in infancy or very early childhood. So a very serious condition from just deleting part of one chromosome. Or some cancers like chronic myelogenic leukemia are caused by translocations. Okay, so these errors can cause serious problems. The last section of the chapter is gonna talk about genetics that's completely different from everything else we've learned so far. All of the genetics we've talked about so far in both chapter 14 and chapter 15 has been the genetics of the genes inside your nucleus. Remember, as a human, we have 46 chromosomes inside the nucleus of our somatic cells. What we've been talking about so far is those genes, the about 30,000 genes you have inside your nucleus. But if you remember back to the cell chapter, I taught you you have genes somewhere else. You also have genes inside your mitochondria. And if you were a plant, you would also have genes inside your chloroplast. Okay, these are called extranuclear genes. So genes outside the nucleus. Okay, so they are found inside the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, okay, which chloroplasts are a type of plastid. So if you see the word plastid, just think chloroplast. And their pattern of inheritance or genetics is completely different from everything else we've learned so far. But it's actually very easy, okay? It is from a mother to every single one of her kids. Okay, both her sons and her daughters. So it goes from a mother to every single one of her kids. Okay, so every single one of you listening right now, all of your mitochondrial genes came from your mom. It doesn't matter if you're biological male or biological female, all of your mitochondrial genes came from your mom. If you're a biological female and you're going to have kids of your own someday, all of your kids, both your daughters and your sons, are going to get all of your mitochondrial genes. If you're a biological male and you're going to have kids someday, I'm sorry, but your mitochondrial genes die with you. You cannot pass them on. So they go from a mother to every single one of her kids. They never go from a father to his kids. Okay, so that is the genetics of extranuclear genes. That's the genes inside the mitochondria and the chloroplast. Okay, so that represents the material in chapter 15. Now, as I mentioned when we talked about chapter 14, this is not enough, listening to these genetics lectures. You have to be working through as many practice genetics problems as you can. The questions on the exam are going to be more complicated than the ones we've talked about so far in these lectures. So work through all the practice genetics problems at the end of the chapter in your textbooks. Uh, work through the dynamic study modules in Master in Biology. Work through the practice quiz and the practice tests on the study of Master in Biology. Work through all of Appendix B in your lab manual and then come to the online conferences for me to help you with those genetics problems that you did not understand. Okay, I'll probably also throw up another video lecture going through some practice genetics problems. You need to watch that to help you understand these genetics problems. Make sure you're practicing as much as you can and then coming for help.